I think there's some problem with the audio. I'm sorry, I, we cannot hear. Can someone help me, please? There is some problem with the audio, uh, Vijay. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you now could, it's clear. I, yeah. I can hear you, Dr. Ramchandra. My talk went off all right? Yeah, it was fantastic. But now it is completely off. I can't hear anything from Dr. Amperes. Yeah, even I'm not able to hear him. Can someone help from RSSDI, please? Yeah, I'm not able to hear him too, Vijay. There's some problem. No. Same here. It's good to talk about type yeah, no, 2 diabetes. No, and, 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 yeah. and first, let me present this information that they have some disclosure. Emory University has received funding from the company listed here for investigating initiative projects. The money doesn't come to me. So for today's lecture, I'm going to discuss with you some new, uh, new evidence on the prevalence of diabetes and its complications. I think they are very interesting data. Trends on glycemic control and how we're using drugs to treat patients with type 2 diabetes. And give you an overview of what the ADA and ACE, uh, the American College of Endocrinology, the uh, suggestion for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So start with news. <laughs> so most of you have seen this. This is the International Diabetes Federation map or Atlas. And what it's been saying for the last few years is that the, there is an increasing rate of diabetes in the world. And it says that in the United States or North America would be an increase of 30%. Most of the increase would be in Africa, Middle East, so uh, poor countries and also in Europe, there would be a 15% increase. So if you look at this, uh, gee, it's every, almost everybody's going to get diabetes, that's right. And this is what the Center for Disease Control published a few years ago in 2015, is that there had been an increase in rate in the percentage of people with diabetes and the number of cases with diabetes and as we know right now are over 34 million people with diabetes. So thinking in preparing this lecture, I went to the website from the Center for Disease Control and this slide shows the obesity epidemic. So here you see that overweight is about 40% and now in, in women and in men, the percentage of people who are obese is about 40%. And not too long ago, a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine says by 2030, 2030, about 50% the, uh, the of Americans will be obese. So I said, gee, so have we lost the battle? Where are we really on the prevalence of diabetes in the United States? And this is data from, from the CDC. Uh, what it shows is that the prevalence and incidence trends for diagnosis of diabetes in adults. So prevalence means the number of people in the populations and incident is taking in consideration the time, the, oh, sorry, the time uh, interval. And here you see that the, it looks like in this paper, the prevalence was stopped and the incidence is coming down. And they explain that here the arrow shows when the diagnostic criteria were changed. And of course, in 2010, we accepted hemoglobin A1C as one of the diagnostic criteria together with fasting blood glucose and the oral glucose tolerance test. So, so, so these data suggested that maybe not everybody's going to get diabetes, that's right. And, and the last year or two years ago, the CDC published that the new cases of diagnosed diabetes in the United States have decreased by 35%. So there was a peak in 2009. That's when we changed the classification of diabetes, but it looks like it's coming down, the prevalence. 
uh, and and this was published in by the CDC. And there is a more recent publications in B BMJ Open Diabetes Research and Care, again from the CDC, showing that again here is where the diagnostic criteria were changed, that the number has stabilized and the incidence so during this period has coming down. After almost 20 years of increasing prevalence of diabetes, the incidence is lower now than it was before. So I think this is related to the edu education programs and intervention programs. People are eating less amount of carbohydrate, and I hope that this is correct. And if you look at different age range, again, you see the stabilization in the numbers. And in children, preschool children, the prevalence of diabetes is coming down. So if you were thinking that, oh my goodness, we're getting too fat, too obese, maybe everybody's going to get diabetes. Maybe that's not the case. So good news. And unfortunately, the decrease in the prevalence of diabetes is primarily seen in Caucasians, with minorities still having an increased rate of diabetes. Here you have in this uh, compares to Caucasians all the way to the right. Here is for men and for women, you will see that minorities patients, especially Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, the prevalence of diabetes is significantly increased. Why is that? Likely it's due to social determinant of health. That's right, access to care, access to insurance, incomes, education, that all plays a role. And with the American Diabetes Association, we're working uh, significantly uh, about health inequalities because we know that complications and prevalence of diabetes go together in racial and ethnic minorities and low-income adult populations. And poorest diabetes outcome in this population and mortality is higher because in the lower and low economic, low Socioeconomic, socioeconomic adult patients in the United States. So what about complications? Again, this is data from the, from the CDC. And this is published by in the New England by Ed Gregg. And what you see in here in the top is incidence of myocardial infarction, stroke, amputation, end-stage kidney disease or dialysis, and hyperglycemic crisis death. And here you see, this is the mortality for GKS that is now less than 1%. So the prevalence is coming down of the, in, on the, on the, the lower rate of diabetic related complications. And not only in the United States, but around the world. This is data from Sweden. And you have here in blue, patient with type two diabetes and in red, patient with no diabetes. And you have in here is death for any cause. In the right upper quadrant is death for cardiovascular disease. In the bottom is coronary heart disease death and hospitalization with cardiovascular disease. So good news. The prevalence of these complications is decreasing significantly, but we must keep in mind that this is the bluish patient with diabetes and the red is non-diabetic. There's still a lot of things to work on because mortality and complications in patients with diabetes still significantly higher compared to those who do not have diabetes. So what about children? And, and this is an area that we must take in consideration. This is data from today's study, that's right. First, it tells you that minorities patients have more chances to have diabetes in youth. This is uh, average age about 13. And the today's study is a five years perspective NIH study that look at treatment with metformin, metformin alone, metformin with lifestyle, and metformin with rosiglitazone. And what you look in here to the right is the proportion of free glycemic failure means hemoglobin A1C greater than 7%. And unfortunately, metformin alone or with lifestyle, about half of the people population fail. A little better with rosiglitazone, the problem is the weight gain. So 50% fail. So after the five years of these today's studies, patients were followed for 10, 10 more years in an observational basis. 
And here to the left, hemoglobin A1C, and during follow-up, continues to increase. And these are adolescents that now they have an uh, average age of uh, 26 years. And what you see is they follow up on hemoglobin A1C, hemoglobin A1C levels during the different periods of follow up in these studies. So we want the hemoglobin A1C to be closer to seven or less than seven. So here you have 6.5, where the percentage of patients after the study completion continues to decrease. This is 6.5 6 to 8%. In green is eight to 10%. And in the top, is greater than 10%. So right now, 10 years later, after the today's studies, the patients can be treated in whatever way. There's about 30 to 45% who have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 10. And if you look at hemoglobin A1C greater than eight, that you don't want that to happen, it's more than 50%. So a significant number of patients have a complications rate. And in a paper published a couple of weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine with this today's study, with 50% of them having hemoglobin A1C greater than seven or eight, here you have the rate of complications. Uh, hypertension, this is young with an average age of 26 years, 26 years. You see that they have the incidence of hypertension in two thirds of the patients, 67%, they started on 19.2, when they finish their today's studies. Look here, kidney disease, more than half of those kids, those children, age 26, already have kidney disease. This lipidemia that increased the risk of coronary heart disease later in life is 50% increasing from 20 to 50. And neuropathy went up from 1% to 32%. So scary, uh, scary statistics, that's right. And here to the right is any microvascular disease, so retinopathy, nephropathy, or uh, 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 nephropathy or neuropathy, these three microvascular disease during the 10 year follow up period. And here you have that at nine years, 50% already have, and at 15 years, three fourths of those young adolescents that were followed for 10 years, age 26 now already have evidence of microvascular disease. So there is tremendous things. And this is a group of people that we don't really have good care. And also from the CDC, the Diabetes Care last year published this data that during the past five years, we have seen a resurgence of chronic complications such as diabetic ketoacidosis admissions uh, and ED visits. And to the right is the increase in lower extremities amputations. I work at Grady when I have a large clinic and we have somewhere around 250 amputations per year. So we must pay attention that in young fellows, the rate of complication is going sky high. And the other thing is that although we have decreased cardiovascular mortality, there is an increase in the last few years of diabetic ketoacidosis and amputations. It's scary three-fourths of those patients over the age of, about the age of 26 already has some microvascular complications. So the next topic that I think it would be of interest to you is that, well, how are we doing with glycemic control? We just showed data out there in today's study, but what about in adults? So this paper is fascinating. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in June 10th or June 11th. And what it shows in here is the percentage of, in blue is glycated hemoglobin less than seven, and this orange color less than 8%. Let's figure, let's focus on the blue line. And this is the percentage of people who were very well controlled, who were reaching hemoglobin A1C less than seven. And then 2000, it went from 44 to 2010, about 57.4%. So a significant improvement in hemoglobin A1C. The hemoglobin A1C greater than eight went from 66 to almost 80%. Unfortunately, during the last five years or 10 years, we have seen a decline in the good glycemic control. So we went to 44 to 58, and now we're down to 50%. So there's a lot of room that we can improve diabetes care. And in the same publication you have here is, well, how these patients are treated. So 
In blue is no medicine, about 17% who have been stable during the past 10 years. In orange is one medicine, one single oral agent or medications. This is two oral agents and more than three medications. So if you look this figure to the left and you say, gee, we're not doing that well, 50% are not a goal, but 50 or 60% are treated with just one medicine or no medicine. So, so we're, if, if we have that large number of people fully control, some three medicine or two medicine is just seen in about 80% of people. Doctors are not increasing the medications of these patients or patients don't take it. So I am sure that we have discussed this in previous lectures, that now we have two group of medications that have been shown to have cardiorenal protection. So reduction in cardiovascular disease, the reduction in the progression of kidney disease. So they are the SGLT2s and the GLP1. So they should be used much more. But if you look in this figure here to the left, only 7% of patients with type 2 diabetes, this is data up to 2018, 7% are treated with the SGLT2 or GLP1 combination, uh, uh, in, uh, both together. If you look at the percentage of people who have received medicine, it's about 80%, sure. Look at metformin went up from the year 2000 to 2018, went from 34% to 60%, perfect. Metformin is the number one agent that is recommended by the ADA and all of the organizations in this world. Sulfonylurea use because of the recent hypoglycemia and weight gain went up to about 40% now down to 24%. Insulin is about 26%. DPP-4 about 11%. And what is striking, is very striking, is that the SGLT2 and GLP-1 are not being used by our primary care physicians. So there's a lot of room to improve. So what do the guidelines of the ADA and American College of Endocrinology would suggest? That's right. And, and, and this has been an evolving story that has been based on scientific data. Between 1990 to 2008, we only care on efficacy, bringing that hemoglobin A1C down. Before 1990, we didn't know that glycemic control was important. But there were studies like this, like the Diabetes Complication Control Trial in patients with type 1 diabetes, the first one that target a hemoglobin A1C less than 7%, which suggests that with increasing hemoglobin A1C, there is an increasing rate of microvascular complications, increase of microalbuminuria, neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. So that was the recommendations. Uh, to have hemoglobin A1C less than seven, because if you achieve good glycemic control with hemoglobin A1C less than seven compared to eight or nine in the control group, you were able to reduce retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy somewhere between 50 to 60%. This study was the main recommendation, the, the main recommendation of this study is that to achieve a hemoglobin A1C less than seven. That was in type one diabetes. The second landmark study that also suggested that seven should be the goal is what is called the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Studies or UK PDS. Here to your left is the hemoglobin A1C of this patient. They were newly diagnosed or recently diagnosed who started on diet and exercise. And this was the intensive control. And this study was done in the 90s. So at that time, they didn't have all this fancy medicine that we have now. These patients were treated with the sulfonylurea, insulin, and a small group were treated with metformin. And you have good differentiation between these two groups, and this patient has been followed now for long periods of time. And during the study period, published in 1998, five years later of so the UK, UK PDS reported that there was a significant reduction of microvascular endpoint by 25%, retinopathy by 30%, albuminuria by 30%, even sudden death. And these studies concluded 
that, oops, that for each percentage reduction of hemoglobin A1C, it doesn't matter where you start, you can go from 10 to 9, 9 to 8, 8 to 7. You decrease for one each percent, 21% of death related to diabetes, 37% of microvascular complication, and 14% myocardial infarction. That was the reason that during these periods in the 90 to 2008, we only care about reduction of hemoglobin A1C, target glycemic control, intensified glycemic control. But the, the, the story changed in 2008 to 2017 because we recognized that if you intensify glycemic control, you have increased rate of hypoglycemia. So here, for example, have these large international studies. We have the advanced studies done mostly in the United States, 10,000 patients, uh, advanced, mostly done in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, more than 10,000 patients. The ACCORD trial was also more than 10,000 patients in the United States, and VADT had close to 3,000 patients. This is the veteran diabetes studies. And all of these studies says that intensive glycemic control is associated with increased rate of, comp of, of hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia, unfortunately, is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. And this is a meta-analysis over close to a million people, 900,000 uh, uh, patients that were followed for a period of one to five in the advanced DADT, you see that there is an increased rate of cardiovascular complications. And this is data also prospective randomized studies and retrospective studies. So we change from just looking at hemoglobin A1C, now hypoglycemia prevention. Though we have to individualize algorithm. The American College of Physicians published this beautiful graph that tell us you have to look at benefit and risk of harm, quote unquote, hypoglycemia, also a burden to the patients and cause. The American Diabetes Association in 2015 put in this classic figure that we have to individualize the glycemic control according to hypoglycemia risk. So if you have a patient that have very little risk of hypoglycemia, normal kidney function is little obese, you can be more stringent, or if you use medication that are not associated with hypoglycemia, you should try to get a hemoglobin and see as close as possible. But you also take disease duration, life expectancy, the presence of renal cardiovascular complications. So if you have a patient already with poor complications, eye, kidney, legs, maybe you don't need to get a hemoglobin one c or six or seven. Just create it, take it between seven to eight percent. So Nobody can tell you what is the target for all patients with hemoglobin A1C. This is something that you have to decide with your patient how stringent you should be according to the presence of complications. Nevertheless, the recommendations of the American Diabetes Association is that for most patients with diabetes, seven to less than seven should be the goal. A says less than 6.5, but if you can achieve that without hypoglycemia, and you have to be taking into consideration what we mentioned before, comorbid conditions. The American College of, the American College of Physicians they recommend to have the hemoglobin A1C between 7 to 8, less, eight, less than 8%. But in those patients who have a, they're in good health, life expectancy greater than 10, 15 years, maybe you should try to get it less than 7%. So all the guidelines are about the same. Seven appears to be a magic number. If you can do less than that with no hypoglycemia, no major burden to the patient, go ahead. But if you have complications, seven to eight should be the goal. So how we should treat patients with diabetes? Let me first show this graph because it is amazing. We, right now we have 12 different group of medicines with different mechanisms of action to treat diabetes. 12 of them will have the sulfonylurea, the insulin is a critical thing, by one eyes, and all of them listed in this slide. So how do we use them? So every single organization 
the ADA, IVF, all of them suggest that metformin should be the preferred initial treatment for most patients with diabetes. Why? Because it's cheap. You can get it even free if you go to some pharmacies. It decreases hemoglobin A1C by one or two percent. The initial response is quite high, although after three to five years, it tends to fail. There is no weight gain. Even modest weight loss have been reported in some series. Now, advantageous lipid and the UK PDS suggested that metformin decreases the rate of acute myocardial infarction. However, this data is in a small number of people in 350 patients, 342 patients. So, so maybe it's true, maybe it's true because when we follow up this patient for 10 years, the group was taking metformin, it had lower rate of cardiovascular disease. But if I want to publish a paper with 342 recommended metformin for cardiovascular disease, it doesn't have the power to convince everybody, but at least we know that metformin is cardiovascular neutral. It has some disadvantages, that's right. It has very high GI side effects and GI intolerance in our group here at Grady is about 20%. So you usually start at the lower dose and build up the dose and usually start on 500 milligrams, go up to 1,000 and then to 2,000 milligrams and I increase according to the GI tolerance. If you start with one gram twice a day, and the patient is going to have nausea, vomit, and diarrhea, for sure, you lose the ability to treat patients with the most economic and very effective medication. So it starts slow. The other thing is that for many years, we had this issue about kidney function, but the FDA now recommends that you can use it all the way up to hemoglobin, uh, GFR of 45, uh, one gram twice a day, between 30 to 45, don't use more than one gram. So max is one gram per day. And less than 30, you have to stop the medication. It also says that you shouldn't start people on metformin if the GFR between 30 to 45. I'm not sure I'd always follow that rule. But below 30, you should hold it because there is a risk of lactic acidosis. In addition, shouldn't be used in patients with active heart failure, being treated for heart failure. But after heart failure goes away, you can start metformin again. So next, sulfonylureas. You know, 30% of the Americans are treated with sulfonylureas and around the world, more than 50%. Why? Because it works fast. If I, I promise, I give you a sulfonylurea tablet, you're going to go low later on in the day. It's once a day, minimal cost. <laughs> it's as effective as metformin, reducing hemoglobin O1C about 1% to 2%. Uh, you know, good. But the problem is hypoglycemia. This is data from the Carolina Cardiovascular Outcome Trial published in JAMA a couple of years ago. And it works. This is compared to linagliptin, that of course, DPP4 are not associated with hypoglycemia. And this is the glimepiride, an average dose of 2 to 3 milligrams per day where more than 30% have one or more episodes of hypoglycemia. So that is the reason why we really don't like, I don't use too much sulfonylureas these days in my patients. So disadvantages, hypoglycemia, 30% of patients. People gain weight. You have to be careful, especially in patients with hepatic and renal dysfunction, the older, and more importantly, there are no studies have shown that sulfonylureas, despite reducing hemoglobin A1C, have any positive impact on cardiovascular or renal protection. So uh, the only reason to use sulfonylureas, I guess, is lack of insurance. That's right. What about TCDs? So there were, used to be three in the market. Now it's only one, Actos or paoglitazone. It's good. It reduces peripheral insulin resistance. Reduces hemoglobin A1C as good as metformin sulfonylureas, no hypoglycemia is generic. And it has cardiovascular protection, especially with stroke. But unfortunately, why is only 3% of Americans are treated with DCDs? 3% is by produce weight gain and people gain somewhere between two to four kilos. If I tell you that you're going to gain 10 pounds, you don't take that when people drop it. It has a slow instead of action that you have to wait up to 12 weeks. And unfortunately, produced edema and worsening of heart failure 
in most people is contraindicated in patients with heart failure and has been shown to increase the risk of fractures. In, in prevention studies, increase the risk of fractures and have osteopenia in these people. So uh, I don't use it too much. Uh, the good thing is cheap, it's generic, but unfortunately the list of disadvantages is quite large and people don't use it too much. But if you have to use it, don't use more than 15 to 30 milligrams. In India, patients are treated with 7.5 milligrams. Some people with 15 milligrams, you have little edema and they do very, very well. What about DPP4? Now they are in the market close to 20 years. There are many in the market and there is low risk of hypoglycemia, and very little adverse events. People don't even know they're taking something. So it's weight neutral. It has no a favorable adverse event I've mentioned before, and you can use it in patients with heart failure and patients with renal insufficiency. You can even use it in dialysis. And these medications work by increasing insulin production and decreasing glucagon concentrates. So this slide shows the reduction of DPP4 and hemoglobin A1C as monotherapy. They have a low dose and high dose in all of them. And this is the main problem, that hemoglobin A1C reduction is no more than 0.5 to 0.8%. So, and it's $300 a month. So, and the other thing is cardiovascular neutral. Multiple studies have shown that trying to evaluate the effects on cardiovascular outcome. And unfortunately, they don't have cardiovascular outcome. If I put here for renal protection, unfortunately, no cardiovascular, no renal protection, a minimal reduction in hemoglobin A1C. That is why DPP4 use is decreasing from about 18% a few years ago to about 10% now. So when do I use DPP4? In some in elderly patients, patients with renal compromise that they don't want to take injections. What about GLP-1? So GLP-1 receptor agonists have been studied now for many years and we have some of them are used daily, and some of them are low acting or used weekly. Exenotide daily is not available. Lixi never made it in the United States, but they have liraglutide once daily. Now it's accepted uh, by uh, Medicaid. So I'm using a lot of liraglutide now because it can be prescribed with Medicaid and Georgia Medicaid. They have weekly, like exenotide weekly, albiglutide was taken off the market and we have dulaglutide and semaglutide. So these are weekly medicines and semaglutide oh, is an oral formulation like I'll show you in a minute. So how good it is they are, how good they are for dropping hemoglobin A1C shown in here. Uh, most of them drop between 0.8 to 1.5 milligrams. So it's great. You get a similar to metformin or even better to metformin, but more than just the reducing hemoglobin A1C, GLP-1, has been shown to have extra pancreatic benefit. Extra pancreatic benefit. It decreases hemoglobin A1C by increasing insulin, reducing glucagon, and also by slowing down gastric emptying. Here you have the GLP-1, it reduces gastric emptying. So normally you empty your stomach within 90 to 120 minutes, and by reducing the gastric emptying, of course, you reduce the postprandial dispersion of glucose. The other thing is that reduce appetite, increase satiety. There are studies using, you know, you go to a buffet, all you can eat before and after 12 weeks of granin GLP-1. At baseline, people ate a lot, and then 12 weeks after therapy, the consumption of meal is significantly less because that message that says you are full is not present in a lot of us. But taking this medicine, you increase society and decrease hunger. So because of that, it's associated with some weight loss. And here you have the weight changes and different com compounds, DLP-1, and you see that they are associated with somewhere around two to four kilograms weight loss. So why do we use it a lot? Because it, improve glycemic control, decrease appetite, decrease body weight. In addition, it's decreased blood pressure by about four to five millimeters of mercury, systolic blood pressure. And those benefits have resulted in improvement in cardiovascular outcome. 
something that we call MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events that include acute myocardial infarction, death of cardiovascular disease and stroke. And there are studies with liraglutide, a study that is called LIDER, semaglutide, albiglutide, and dulaglutide. And those studies have shown ex a spectacular results. So the first one is called LIDER. This study close to 10,000 patients, 9,300 patients who already had cardiovascular disease, who have multiple cardiovascular risk factor with hemoglobin A1C greater than seven, were randomized to receive placebo or liraglutide on top of oral agents or insulin. And what this study reported is a reduction of major cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular events, so death for cardiovascular cause, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal stroke was reduced by 13%, and mortality by 20%, mortality with 20%. Similar to the larutide, there is another study with semaglutide. This study was called SUSTAIN-6. Again, they took over 3,000 patients with high cardiovascular risk for cardiovascular event already established 80%. With hemoglobin A1C greater than seven, we randomized to SEMA or placebo. And they reported that a reduction in MACE of 25%. With, uh, and here you have myocardial infarction with the in semaglutide by 25%. Stroke, a reduction of 30 to 40%. And MACE, I've told you before, 25%. So very impressive results. So liraglutide, semaglutide, this is albiglutide, published a couple of years ago. Again, you saw a reduction of 20% reduction in MACE. And with dulaglutide, a one weekly uh, compound, you saw MACE reduction by about 12%. This paper was published in last. So, so all of the GLP-1 have shown to have, kind of, no, most of them have shown cardiovascular event benefits. So what about the renal protection effects? So in the leader, in the liraglutide group, these 10,000 patients show a significant reduction of a composite of new onset, new onset micro, macro albuminuria, doubling of serum creatinine, or dropping of GFR less than 45, or need for dialysis. And that was reduced by 22%. So not only that reduced cardiovascular mortality, but also reduced this composite of renal. And to the right is the persistence of macro albuminuria more than 300. So if you have, this is on top of A's and ARB's. And this is another study with dulaglutide and the renal effects. So this is comparing the low dose, high dose of dula compared to insulin. So we use insulin, but insulin has no cardiovascular protection, have no renal protection. It doesn't induce cardiovascular disease, it doesn't kill your kidneys. But unfortunately, it doesn't prevent the decline in glomerular filtration rate and it doesn't protect you with the appearance of microalbuminuria. What dulaglutide, the GLP-1, reduced microalbuminuria, insulin did not. And this is when they sustain six with uh, semaglutide and nephropathy. So you prevent kidney disease in about 20 to 40%, doubling of serum creatinine, reduction of microalbuminuria. This great effects of the GLP-1 have led to the American College of Physicians to state that if you have some bad oral agents, if you're thinking to use insulin or GLP-1, the two injectables that we have, you should consider using the GLP-1 as your first line agent. And if it doesn't get it, uh, then you use uh, GLP-1 with that uh, agent. Uh, so the first line injectable, uh, according to the ADH, would be a GLP-1 because it produces weight gain, weight loss, cardiovascular protection, improvement oh. of, of hemoglobin oh, A1C, equal to insulin, no hypoglycemia, great protection for your kidneys. Oh, uh, and this is to uh, show you that now we're learning to use the oral semaglutide. It's kind of tricky sometimes, but it's as effective. The oral semaglutide is as effective as the injectable liraglutide, and it's much more effective in reducing hemoglobin A1C as a DPP4, even for the GLP-1, SGLT2s. 
here you have, for example, oral semaglutide versus cetagliptin. Significant, the top is hemoglobin A1C and the bottom is weight loss. The use of semaglutide oral is short, as short good term, as a injectable liraglutide. So we're learning to use this. And, and of course, uh, not every insurance is covered, but it's very attractive medication. And just for completion, can it has to be a reverse right? uh, GLP-1 produces gastrointestinal nausea in about 30 to 40 percent of patients. That is why you have to start at the low dose, and you build the dose up every month when the stomach settles and the patient will be able to tolerate. And most patients will. The nausea is very no. mild, but if they're losing weight, they'll take it. The other is that injectable, but now we have an oral formulation cannot be used in patients with pancreatitis or patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the main problem is cost. And not every insurance will cover, so you have to get pre-approval. So the utilization is not great. So let's move up to the last group of medicines that have appeared, that is the, the SGLT2s. You He's have four in the market. In some countries, say like Japan, they have seven in no. the market, and they work. In a completely different mechanism, but they help one increase insulin. No, it doesn't touch insulin. They work by flushing glucose in the urine because you inhibit the SGLT2 that has involved in the reabsorption of 80 to 90 percent of the glucose in the proximal tubule. And by blocking the absorption of glucose, you get glycosuria. And if you get glycosuria, your blood sugars come down and you also lose calories because glycose glucose in the urine is four grams, four calories per gram. So it works fast. It's not as potent as insulin or GLP-1, but reduces hemoglobin A1C. It doesn't produce hypoglycemia, similar to GLP-1. Low risk of hypo, weight loss, blood pressure reduction, and we will see they have ex excellent cardiovascular and more importantly, renal protection effect. This is a comparison of the three of the most commonly used, it's SGLT2, SCANA, DAPA, and NEMPA. It does put that potent, but it reduces hemoglobin A1C about 0.6, reduce weight loss about two to four kilograms. So it's not bad. And more importantly, it has been shown to have cardiovascular and renal protection. This is just uh, three studies large uh, with NEMPA glyphloxin, CANA glyphloxin, and DAPA glyphloxin again looking at mace uh, and and you have a reduction the empa a reduction of major cardiovascular events mild cardiac infarction and and stroke I'm and death for the timing, please. was reduced by 14 percent here is canvas again a beneficial effect 13 percent and more recently what it has been shown is that not only that you do decreased death and cardiovascular event, but this is reduction on heart failure readmission admissions. And it's impressive. The, there was a 35% reduction in heart failure admissions in the high risk population with the use of EMPA, a similar reduction by canvas and DAPA glyphloxin. And this has been shown to be effective not only in patients with diabetes, but in patients without diabetes. And in patients who have low ejection fraction, the use of DAPA glyphloxin has been no, shown to decrease the death there. by 20% and readmission to the hospital Fine. by 40%. So the FDA now has finished the discussion time for people who have yeah. Yeah. heart failure. So not only in randomized clinical trial, but they, in, in, in real world, large number of patients over a couple of, a quarter million people, you see that all cause death with any one of these uh, SCLT2s in population studies. And this is hospitalization for heart failure. So there is no question that SCLT2s have a cardiovascular protection. What about renal protection? And the, the data on renal protection is extremely impressive. And all of them have been shown to reduce nephropathy. This is the and reduce microalbuminuria. You, many times we see regression of microalbuminuria. And this is so important because if you have micro or macroalbuminuria, the rate of myocardial infarction, the rate of death of cardiovascular cause 
double or triple. So by reducing microalbuminuria, there is a regression of macro to normal in, in about 20 to 15 to 20% of patients. And this is on top of A's and ARB's. So if I have a patient that is being on ARB for blood pressure or renal protection and still have proteinuria, I know that decreasing proteinuria may improve cardiovascular outcome. This is kind of the previous studies was with uh, uh, EMPA. This study is with CAMBA, so CANA is exactly the same. A reduction in change of albumin creatinine ratio in these people. And, and this is the last study, large study uh, that, that is impressive is because it included patients not only in those who have no disease, but with significant impairment of glomerular filtration rate. Here, e ejection fraction uh, down to 30, already protein between 300 and 5 grams, so a nephrotic range proteinuria. And what you're going to see in here is the primary outcome was doubling of serum creatinine, need for dialysis, or renal or cardiovascular death was decreased by 30%. So no question, that is quite impressive. And this is CKD, very similar, a reduction of endpoint, similar to the previous one, about 40%, <laughs> and, and proteinuria in about 40% of people. So if you look at the where we are with respect to SEO, with heart failure, no question, 30 Hello. to 40% reduction. May, some studies were positive. We see a good response, cardiovascular death. But with renal, it's the most impressive. All of them, similar to heart failure, have been shown to reduce proteinuria, to decrease the rate of doubling of serum creatine, the need of dialysis reduced by about 40%. And some of them have also shown a reduction in cardiovascular death in these people. So how this data has changed our guidelines. So in the year 2018, I was a member of a second round in the We used to say, you used to monotherapy, not go, you go to dual therapy. And after two years ago,